Hi. Today we're going to take a look at Protus. Uh, what are Protus? Well, when we're looking at the kingdom division of all of the life, uh, we had uh, bacteria and archaebacteria were prokaryotes, and all the eukaryotes are broken down into plants, animals, fungi, and Protus. So it's a kingdom classification of organisms that could not be placed in the animal, plant, or fungus kingdom, even though they have characteristics of them. It's kind of like a leftover category. Here's all the things that were eukaryotes but didn't quite fit into the category. Some similarities and differences amongst all the protists. They are all eukaryotes, meaning they all have cells with a nucleus. Some of them more than one nucleus. They live in moist surroundings. They like it where it's moist. They can be either unicellular or multicellular. They do come in both types. Uh, some of them are autotrophs. They use photosynthesis to make their own food. Some of them are heterotrophs, have to eat something else. And there are even some that are both autotrophs and heterotrophs. That in the sunlight, they can make their own food. And when there's no sunlight, they can go around eating other things. And uh, obviously, some can move and others cannot move. The three categories that we break protists into is animal-like, plant-like, and fungus-like. So they're all in there because they have similarities to the other three categories, but had enough differences that they didn't fit in the category. So when we take a look at the first, animal-like protists are called protozoans. Anytime you see that Z-O, zo means animal. So protozoans are the animal-like protists. They are all unicellular and they are all heterotrophs. We break them into four different groups based on how they move. Pseudopods, cilia, flagella, and then the others that don't move on their own. The ones that are able to move with pseudopods are in a group called the sarcodines. Um, sarcodines uh, use pseudopods, which really means false feet. Pseudo means false and pod means foot. Uh, their cell membrane pushes in one direction, and if it's finding what it needs, the cytoplasm will flow out into that bulge, and this allows the protozoan to move, um, dragging the rest of the cell behind it. So under a microscope, you would see this thing that just kind of looks like a big blob, and each where one of these blobs kind of has a pokey outy part, that's a pseudopod, like a false foot reaching out to see if there's something useful there. Now I've got a video of a pseudopod moving. Now this is an amoeba and inside we can see the cell membrane that's all around the outside. Inside all these little things are the organelles and food vacuoles and things moving around. And we see over here on this side, everything is kind of pushing and moving into these because it's looking for food. And over here it's not finding what it needs so it's kind of pulling over in and pushing into the other areas. That's how it moves. Now, these pseudopods, um, part of how they eat, they push out a couple of different of their pseudopods and wrap it around something that will be food. And when it pinches together, notice over here, everything is outside cell membrane. When it pushes together, it pinches here, and what was outside cell membrane becomes the membrane that surrounds the food vacuole, and the rest of the outside cell membrane is still intact, and it brings inside a food vacuole. That way, the food that it brings in is protected from eating its insides. Now, here's a video of a pseudopod, and it's gonna, you're going to see it uh, eat to paramecium. Paramecium are a different kind of protists that we'll see in a minute. All right, I'm going to pause here. Now, we see this paramecium is here and another paramecium is here and the big blobby thing is the pseudopod and you're going to see this come out and start to go around and it bumps into this one it's going to go under it and around it and it's also going over it so it's surrounding these see it just kind of flowing around and when it's all around everything it's pinched off now this is now a food vacuole Inside of it, it has these things called lysosomes, little 
um, organelles that contain their digestive acids and enzymes. And I won't tell you when, but I think it's very obvious when a lysosome docks with this food vacuole and the paramecium start to, uh, shall we say, react. And here we see the paramecium are uh, responding to their environment. This is a losing battle for them. And we see that the enzymes and acids from the lysosome um, make pretty quick work of them and break them down. And then it starts to uh, pull in and digest what it needs. The pseudopods, uh, the sarcodines, for reproduction, they are able to reproduce by binary fission and conjugation. Now, binary fission, binary fission is an asexual method of reproduction. The benefit in there is it's able to reproduce much faster. Conjugation is a type of sexual reproduction where they're able to share some of the DNA back and forth so that they become some differences. The advantage of having sexual reproduction is that there's a greater genetic variety of the species. When we're looking at the bacteria, they reproduce by binary fission, which means the entire colony is a clone of each other. So if something comes along that can kill one of them, it can kill them all. By being able to swap back pieces of DNA between each other, they're now able to become different genetically than they were before. Now, other protozoans that are able to move around with something called cilia, they're called ciliates. Um, the cilia are little hair-like structures, these little proteins that are covered their entire outside of their organism. And that organism, they use those to move, get food, and sense their environment. Um, they are all unicellular, and they all have two nuclei. One large nuclei, which is their macronucleus, controls their everyday function. They have one small nuclei, a micronucleus, which is exclusively used for sexual reproduction when they are using conjugation. Uh, they are also able to reproduce by binary fission, asexual, or by conjugation, sexual reproduction. An example of a ciliate would be this paramecium. We just saw two paramecium's um, meet their end with a sarcodyne, the amoeba. Here's a video, a very short 30 second video. This microscope is looking at a paramecium and what you'll see around the outside are these little teeny, teeny, tiny high hairs. You'll only see them around the outside, but they cover the whole thing. But because it's a light microscope, you won't see the hairs that are on the top or bottom, just what's around the outside. And you'll see the way it moves is by kind of like almost little teeny, tiny oars. They're all kind of beating in the same direction. And when it needs to back up, bloop, they all start beating in the opposite direction. Um, they're actually able to move very, very quickly. This video uh, slows it down because the paramecium was inside of a very thick, viscous medium so that it slowed it down so it could be caught by the uh, microscope a lot easier. Another kind of protozoan are ones that move with flagella. A uh, flagella is another, it's similar to a cilia in that it's the same kind of protein structure, almost like a hair, except it's a lot longer in comparison to the size of the organism. Now, these organisms that are flagellates, uh, we call them zooflagellates. Again, zo meaning animal-like, they are protozoans, and flagellates, they move using a flagella. Uh, this long whip-like part, the flagella, they use to move. Now, in these pictures, you can notice these long whip-like structures are definitely a lot longer than the cilia that we saw around the paramecium. Now, the other type of fourth type of protozoan are the ones that, well, they don't move on their own. They're called sporozoans and they're parasites. Um, parasites, not just from the perspective that they're uh, from a symbiotic relationship, harming something to get the good that they need. Uh, in this case, they're also, their movement is parasitic. They need something else to be able to move them around. Uh, they pass from one host to another inside of protective spores. A spore has this um, hard protective, kind of like armor coating on the outside. Uh, cannot move on their own. 
and they feed on cells and body fluids of their hosts. One of the most harmful, a plasmodium, um, is the type of protist that causes malaria. Uh, one of the interesting things about the plasmodium is that in order to survive, it has to have two different hosts. When a mosquito bites an infected person, and it's the female mosquito that bites to get the blood meal, she needs a blood meal in order to be able to reproduce. Uh, but if this person is infected and the spores are in their blood, when she drinks the blood, the spores get inside of her. They don't harm her, but by moving through her system, they come back around and the next time she bites somebody for another blood meal, she can pass those spores on to another host. The spores, once they're inside the human, will make their way to the liver. Inside the liver, they grow and develop and grow and develop and start to make their own next generation that come out. And what is so harmful about malaria is that their little babies come out and they munch and crunch on red blood cells. And when the red blood cells get busted and broken apart, they don't carry all the oxygen they needed and the jaggy just start to um, clot up and gather in places that they shouldn't to become very harmful and hurtful. Uh, malaria is one of the leading causes of death uh, for kids under the age of five around the world. All right, so those are our animal-like. The next category we had of protists were the plant-like protists. Uh, plant-like protists are called algae. Uh, we also call them phytoplankton. Phyto means plant-like and plank means floater. Uh, they are autotrophs. They are all able to do photosynthesis and make their own food. Uh, the size. Some of them are unicellular, but they also, some of them are extremely large multicellular. Giant kelp are not a plant. They are plant-like. They're an algae. Um, but they can be 100 to almost 200 feet long and can on average grow about one foot a day, but in ideal conditions, they can grow as much as two feet a day. And again, it's a protist. Uh, they do contain different pigments, so they're not all green. Some of them do come in different colors. Um, red ones in particular are also known to make some toxins that are very harmful. Um, some of them are single-celled diatoms. These are the things we talked about in the water unit. These are the single-celled floaters that make most of the oxygen you and I breathe. Um, they are covered in little hard shells that are made of silica. Silica is silicon dioxide, the same kind of thing that's in beach sand. But because it is so teeny, teeny, tiny, small and fine, it's a very good abrasive uh, for polishing. So it's used in a lot of toothpastes. And then euglena is a really interesting algae because um, they're the ones that they are both autotrophs they're algae. They can make their own food with photosynthesis, but when there's no light, um, they go around munching and crunching and eating other things around them. They kind of have the best of both worlds. Uh, here's some pictures. In the top left, we've got an algal bloom. Uh, these over here are colonies that live together called volvox. Really interesting. Uh, bottom right, this is a picture of some giant kelp. And bottom left, uh, this is the euglena. The long whip light, this kind of red spot is what helps it sense where the light is, and it does have chloroplasts inside of it. Uh, these are all the different types, well, not even all of this, are some of the different types of diatoms. They come in lots and lots of different shapes, and they're all microscopic, but they live in fresh water, they live in salt water, and different types live in different areas in different amounts. So, for instance, when there's a drowning victim, uh, they can take a sample of the water out of the lungs and be able to tell where they drown because of what kind of diatoms are in the water that's being observed. So that's our plant light. Last category are fungus-like protists. Um, like animals, they are heterotrophs. Um, sorry, actually, that should say like fungi. There are also heterotrophs, but... Um, can be decomposers like the fungi. Well, didn't read that right, sorry. Um, similar to plants though, like fungus, they do have a cell wall, but their cell wall is not the kind of cell wall that fungi have. They don't have chitin. They have cellulose just like plants have and some bacteria. Uh, they also, they're able to reproduce like spores, same way that fungi do. Uh, they're not in the fungi kingdom because uh, they're able to move at the early points in their lives. Uh, fungi cannot move. 
And some examples are water molds, slime molds, and downy mildews. Uh, some of them are also, as you can see in this picture of this fish, parasitic. They are decomposers, but some of them are parasitic just like fungi and can live and eat on living tissue. Here's some other examples of fungi-like protists. All right, some diseases that are caused by protists. Chagas disease is caused by trypanosoma. Uh, this one's interesting because it's carried by this bug that's called the kissing bug. Um, chronic long-term stages of this disease affect the nervous system, digestive system, and the heart. Um, very, very serious long-term uh, disease. Uh, similar, um, another kind of trypanosoma is carried by the tsetse fly. Uh, again, this is a flagellate protozoa. And this results in some swelling of the brain that causes this um, kind of sleepiness. And giardiasis is caused by the giardia protozoa. Um, it spreads through contaminated food and water and infects the bowels. Malaria, we already talked about, it's caused by the plasmodium protozoan. And it's transmitted by mosquitoes that have to be in tropical or subtropical regions of the world. It has to be where it's warm. And amoebic dysentery. Obviously, it's caused by an amoeba, can cause watery diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. If it's not treated, even if the symptoms disappear, this is dangerous because the amoebas can continue to live in the bowel for months or even years. And that means as long as they're in there, they're continuing to be passed out of the bowels and has the ability to then contaminate other food and water that can get into other people and continue to pass the disease along. Uh, preventing diseases caused by protists. Some of these look very familiar, washing hands frequently and avoiding touching your face. They are microscopic, so we need to try and keep them out of our bodies. Um, a lot of them are carried by other in, by insects, so using insect repellent or wearing long sleeve clothing and long pants. Um, using a mosquito net over beds at night. The insect mosquito that carries the malaria protozoan uh, frequently feeds at night. So providing mosquito nets to people in those areas so they can sleep protected has a huge way of re removing or reducing the amount of malaria in the area. There are also some anti-malaria drugs that can be used and taken before visiting a malaria-prone area. Um, a lot of these protists are living in water, so don't drink water if it might be contaminated. If you suspect the water or ice that was made from that water is contaminated, always make sure that you boil it first to kill anything inside. And make sure that you cook food to its correct temperatures. So if anything parasitic is infected inside the food, it's killed off. Finally, treating diseases caused by the protists. Um, again, interesting that some of the protists have a cell wall that is similar to plant cells wall. And just like some of the bacteria that have cell walls that have the same kind of cell wall as plants, um, that means that some of them can be killed with antibiotics. Um, there's also uh, several different medicines that can kill protozoans. Um, because they are animal-like, their cell structures are very similar to our cell structures. So it can be very difficult to develop new medicines that will kill them, uh, but won't harm human cells. 